Mr. Simon Perez. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please show your appreciation as we invite to the stage the man for whom we have all gathered here to honor tonight. On behalf of Kern ISOD UIA, please welcome the recipient of the Nadiv Award, Mr. Frank Lowy. reads in the presence of the President of the State of Israel, His Excellency Mr. Shimon Peres, the Nadiv Keren Hayesod Award is hereby presented to Mr. Frank Lowy AC in recognition of and with heartfelt thanks for decades of leadership, generosity and boundless care for the State of Israel and the Jewish people through Keren Hayesod United Israel Appeal. Thank you. And the actual award, the Nadiv Award, as you can see here, has a, an original uh, print of the Manifesto of Keren Hayesod, which was established and proclaimed in London in 1920. Thank you, President Perez. I have received some accolades in my life, but this honor tonight supersedes all. That I have received it from your hand, Shimon, increases the significance to me tremendously. I can't tell you, words cannot describe of how I feel when you were here on my, in my honor and do this great honor for me. I'll never forget it for the rest of my life. Thank you, Shimon. Yoki, thank you for a, your generous introduction. I'm not sure it is all deserved. Nevertheless, I would like to thank you very much. Your organization, Karen Hayesod, is, a very, is very important. It creates a continuous relationship within diaspora and Israel, and of course it fulfills a vital role for Aliyah and Klita, all part of the Jewish Agency. Ladies and gentlemen, had the Jewish Agency not taken me out of that miserable place in Europe after the Second World War and brought me to Palestine, who knows where I might have ended up? That was about 65 years ago, and I was just a boy. This year, when I <clears throat> heard I was to receive the Nadiv Award, I asked myself, why am I getting this honor? How did it happen that it was given to me? Getting involved in Jewish and Israeli causes came to me naturally. But when I reflect back and think of my childhood years, I believe it was my upbringing in a Jewish home with a strong tradition of sharing. That is what has shaped my life. Come with me along on a brief journey back to Slovakia and you'll see what I mean. We are in the middle of the 1930s. It's a time of economic hardship and poverty. Hasidim, who are not occupied by religious work in their communities can find no way of feeding their families. 
So what do they do? They walk from village to village, knocking on doors of Jewish homes, asking for help. Imagine their traditional appearance with their big beards and kaftans as they walk across the countryside for weeks, sleeping wherever they can. They have no comforts and no opportunity to make proper personal hygiene. When Friday comes, they enter the nearest village expecting refuge over Shabbat. Many end up sleeping in the Beit Hamidrash adjoining the Beit HaKneset. They are hungry and are hoping to join a family to share a Shabbat meal. I remember these men coming into our small town where the Jewish community comprised of some 200 souls. Our community was a traditional, observant, and close-knit. A couple of the families were reasonably comfortable, but the, rest of the, but the rest, including my family, I must say, it was a real struggle. On Friday nights, as is customary, the whole community was a Beit HaKneset, except for the women who were at home preparing for their Shabbat meal. These poor travelers were in the shul also. We called them Orchim. During the service, the rabbi would approach the Balabatim to place this or him with families for the Shabbat dinner. The rabbi knew that every time he came to Hugo, my father, there would always be room for two or three of these orchim. Some of the other Balabatim would say, Ich will fragen man wab. I will ask my wife. Of course, the, as the wives were not there, this allowed them to slide away from this obligation. The Orchim would walk home with us and be welcomed. At the time, I was too young to understand what it meant to have these strange, unwashed men at our Shabbat table. That was about 70, 75 years ago, and as you can see, the memory is still, in with, is still with me. I want to describe another <clears throat> event that is also etched in my memory. When I, when I was about 10, the mortgage in our home was due and my father didn't have the money to pay for it. We were on the verge of losing the, the roof over our heads. Mother, who wrote to her brothers and sisters who lived about 100 kilometers away, she was in continuous contact with them anyway. They were small-time grocers and didn't have much, but they collected amongst themselves the money that was needed, and they brought the cash into our home to pay off the mortgage. This is what I experienced when I was a little boy. Come with me again on another small journey, this time from Slovakia to Budapest. It is 1944. <clears throat> the city is under German occupation. Need I say more? My father has been taken away. <clears throat> My oldest brother is on the Russian front. He's a slave laborer for, for the retreating Hungarian army. My other brother and sister are living separately in Budapest on false papers. Mother and I are in the ghetto sharing a small flat with four or five other families. Among other things, food was very scarce. With his false papers, my brother Yankel, who was 18, roams around Budapest. From time to time, he risked his life to bring us a parcel of food. I slip out of the ghetto at night to receive it. I bring the peckle back to mother and what does she do with the food parcel? She unpacks it, and against my strong protestation, she shares it with the other families in the apartment. I said, Mother, please, save some for us for another day. But she takes no notice, and she <clears throat> divides the, the parcel amongst everybody else. At the time, of course, I didn't know it, but now I recognize 
that these early years has shaped me for the rest of my life. When the war ended, we were lost, we left Budapest and went back to Slovakia. But it was not a place for us to be as Jews. It was, thank you. That's very good. I was 15 years old, my family had been torn apart, and I didn't know which way to go. The Jewish agency came to the rescue and put me on a boat to Palestine through Aliyah Beit. On the way, courtesy of the British Navy, I spent some time in Cyprus. In 1946, when I finally stepped ashore in Haifa, the feeling of freedom was indescribable. And that feeling came to me with the Yus Aliyah village in Zdeyakov, where Jewish agency placed me. It's okay, I'm right. There we worked in the fields in the morning. In the afternoon we studied a little, and at night we were dancing. What could have been better than that? After a year or so, I left the Youth Aliyah village to try and make it on my own in Haifa. A few weeks later, on the 9th of November 1947, celebrating the United Nations Declaration for the creation of the new State of Israel. Together with my Hevre from Zdeyakov, I joined the Haganah and then the army. The moment I put on the uniform, I knew I belonged. From a weak refugee boy, I'd been turned into a strong, proud young man and ready to fight for the country. A few months later, I was assigned to the Golani Brigade where I learned another important lesson. I learned how much we needed to rely on each other. In the Golani, I understood fully the effects of collective responsibility. During these years, the, sur the surviving members of my family, through unrelated circumstances, emigrated from Slovakia to Australia. As time went on, I yearned to be with them. After six years of separation, my yearning to be reunited with my mother was overwhelming and I joined her and my brother and sister in Sydney. However, my attachment to Israel stayed with me. Although I became <clears throat> absorbed in my Australian life, within a decade I was re <clears throat> reconnecting with Israel. My reconnection was driven by two things. I got in touch with the girls and boys from my army unit and my Hevre from the Youth Aliyah days, and I became involved with Karen Hayesod. I remember in the early 1960s, I attended my first major donors in Sydney. I wrote out a check for 250 pounds, small compared to now, but significant for those times. It was a modest start, but year after year, as the amounts grew, so did my closeness to Israel. It happened through the Karen Hayesod. This attachment with my Hevra and with the Karen Hayesod the many relationships I have created over the years, together with my love for Israel, became so strong that my wife Shirley and I established a home here. Israel is now a mainstay of my family's existence, and we enjoy very much the relationship that we have established since then here. To our friends here tonight, I thank you for taking us into your hearts. Ladies and gentlemen, I think I have been keeping you here for long enough with my mices. <laughs> but before I go, I want to tell you what a major role Shirley plays in our family's life. She's modest, she's quiet, she does not draw attention to herself, but her influence is great. Not only on me, but on our entire family. Shirley is devoted to us, and she has always put us ahead of her own needs and that I believe is the basis of the success of our family. As a teenager, she wanted to make Aliyah and join the kibbutz Kfar Hanasi, which then had many Australian members. But her parents would not let her go. How fortunate for me that she remained in Sydney. I met her at the Hanukkah party the year I arrived to Australia, and the rest is history. She and I shared a commitment to Israel and our sons, David, Peter, and Stephen, their wives and children, are also strongly connected and are frequent visitors here. 
I'm pleased to say that David and his wife Margot are here with us tonight. You already heard before that one of my granddaughters, Jackie, from Los Angeles is also here. I'm very proud that she recently joined the Israeli army and now serves in the OKETS unit. Ladies and gentlemen, in finishing, I'd like to thank Karen Hayesod for bestowing me on the title Nadiv. I repeat that Karen Hayesod creates path for Jews of the diaspora to participate with Israel in a tangible and meaningful way in the gathering of Olim and their absorption to Israel. This, I believe, is a sacred duty for Kol Israel. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>